I can't see the forest for the trees. <laughs> that used to never make any sense to me until I studied Greek. What it means is that it is possible to get so lost in the details of something that you lose your perspective. You forget the sense of the whole. Remember that? Seems like a long time ago that you watched video number one. But if you'll remember when we started this journey together, I warned you that the challenge of Greek will be that you'll get so mired down in these little details that you will lose perspective and it will just feel hopeless. And the problem is that you're so focused in that you have forgot the big perspective. Let me just remind you here that we're just trying to find a way to see these patterns and the patterns that we've learned in the indicative applied in the subjunctive and the imperative, even in the infinitive. And now we apply them to the participle. So let's keep our perspective here today. The perfect participle tense and voice case number and gender. That's always what we're after when we're looking at a participle. So how do I recognize a perfect tense? You already know. Same clues. Reduplication on the front, kappa for the active voice, and no connecting vowel for the middle passive. The perfect is great because it gives you all these clues. Reduplications, kappas for the actives, no connecting vowel for the middle passive. So it gives you multiple clues. Same thing is in the participle as was in the indicative, as was in the imperative, as was in the infinitive. So, so these clues just hold true and hopefully the patterns are starting to emerge for you. Okay. So the tense of a perfect participle, usually pretty easy to recognize. What about the voice? Well, the voice in the active will, will have morphemes that you have to just learn. And these are new. This is the one thing you have to learn. And that is in the active voice, you have caught quia. So if you see caught or quia in there, you know that you're looking at an active voice participle. Now in the middle passive and remember that the perfect tense, the middle and the passive share the same form here. Um, so how do you know? Well, it's men again. As soon as you see men, you know, it's middle or passive. The only exception in all of the participles is that nasty aorist passive, but it's easy to recognize by the theta epsilon, right? So men think middle or passive. Okay. So again, active is cot or quia middle passive is men. Okay. How will I know the case number and gender? Oh, by now this is getting so easy, right? We know that in the active voice, these always follow the three, one, three pattern. If you think about it, that makes sense because you have caught quia caught. Notice that the caught in the masculine ends in a tau, a consonant. So it follows third declension quia in the feminine ends in a nice alpha. So it follows first declension and then caught again in the neuter third declension three, one, three. Okay. In the middle and passive it's men, mena, mene, mena. So omicron, uh, eta omicron. So two, one, two. So in the middle and passive, nice and easy. It's just that nice two, one, two pattern. So there's really lots of clues to help you identify what's going on with every participle. You just have to learn to see these repeating patterns. So here they are the perfect participles and you know, I'm just repeating myself over and over, but trying to drive this stuff home. Okay. Perfect participles tense and voice, case number and gender. All right. How do we recognize the tense? Look at all of these. What do you see? You see reduplication everywhere, right? Now that's easy because these words starts with consonants. Now, if it were in started with a the vowel, they would be vocalic reduplications and look more like augments, but that's okay. We have this weirdness going on on the front, which is easy to see when it's a consonant. And then we have all these coppas everywhere, right? Look at these coppas in the active. Okay. And then in the middle passive, notice that there is no connecting vowel. So lalu menos, not lalu amenos, but lalu menos, lalu menu. The mens are just tacked right onto there. So the perfect tense is pretty easy to see. All right. How about the voice? Okay. Well, the voice we've learned to um, appreciate that these Participle morphemes are our clues for the voice. So the active morphemes are caught, quia, caught for the participle. So here's our cots 
Again, we have the, we don't see the cot in the nominative singular masculine. We're used to him being sort of a bad boy, but okay. Uh, otherwise, cot, quia, cot. We have the neuter. We don't see the cot completely either, but we've got our coppas, which we're used to uh, in the active voice with the perfect, right? Okay. And for our middle passive forms, now notice they share a form, so only context will tell you whether it is middle or passive. We have our mens, mena, mene, mena. So voice is easy to see as well. Okay, tense and voice. And then case number and gender. Okay, here we go again. The active vo voice uses the 313 pattern of declension. Cot, quia, cot. Notice consonant, vowel, consonant. And do I need to do it again? Shall I drag pos in one more time? Just pointing out, follows the same pattern of declension to show you case number and gender that pos does. Okay, we've seen that about enough times probably. And then in the middle passive, how do we know the case number and gender? Now well, the same way, and here we go again, but the same way that we knew the article's case number and gender because it follows the 212 pattern of declension. So we look at these endings which look just like the case endings for the 212 uh, pattern. So no big deal, right? Tense and voice, case, number, and gender. Here is a perfect participle used adjectivally. And so we have ha anthropos, ha geganemenos. What a mouthful, right? Geganemenos, it's from ganao. And so we have a reduplication. Here's our, our root right here. Gan. Notice the lengthened connecting vowel before the ending here, this middle passive ending, men. And then os is our nominative singular masculine, which matches, of course, the article. Okay? Ha anthropos, ha gegen a menos, ek tu thau. Hamartian u poye, the man who has been born from God, sin he doesn't practice. So notice here that having been born from God is the participial phrase, and it's modifying the man. Which man? The having been born of God man. Okay, so this is a perfect passive participle, nominative singular masculine, since it's passive, it's not bearing or giving birth, it's having been born. And we use this word having with the participles a lot, having been born. We want to try to capture this idea of something that's happened with results that abide. But again, it's pretty hard in English. Nothing quite gets the perfect tense in English. And quickly to illustrate what that would look like if there were no noun to modify here. In other words, turning this participle from an adjectival participle, modifying a noun, into a substantival participle where it acts like a noun, okay? Uh, it would be ha gegene menos ek tu u hamartian u poye. Okay, the one having been born from God, sin doesn't do. But notice there's no ha anthropos, ha gegene menos. So there's nothing to modify here. So this has to be the subject. And so we fill in some idea like the one who, the man who, the person who, having been born from God, the one who has been born from God is probably how we would translate this. And you can see how we have to, you know, play a little free and loose sometimes in our translation to make it make sense. Um, because we just really don't use participles this way very often in English. The having been born from God doesn't do sin. The, the, we, we need a subject, okay? But because Greek gives us the case number and gender, where English doesn't, and Greek doesn't have to tell you necessarily the subject explicitly. Because it's nominative singular masculine, we can assume it's the man. Who has been born from God. And clearly, we're talking about human beings here. We're not talking about goats. We're not talking uh, about monkeys. We're talking about men. So it, it's one of the reasons uh, that Greek can do this is because it does give you the case number and gender. It kind of sounds stupid in English because English doesn't. Though the having been born from God, the, the what having been born from God, we don't know in English 
because English doesn't give us case number and gender with participles. Greek does. So in other words, I'm taking a long time to say that this substantival usage here is takes a little work to translate sometimes. The one, the person, the man who has been born from God doesn't practice sin. Now we'll meet this adverbial participle in John 1, but let's take a close look at it here. Agenata, anthropos, okay, a man came. Op estalminos para theu. A man came, having been sent from God. Now notice, no article. So that should really make us think, hmm, this must be adverbial. And sure enough, there's nothing here to modify. And so it, it has to do with the, the coming here. He came having been sent. The man came and, and the having been sent describes the coming. He didn't just show up on his own. He was sent. Okay. So this participle modifies this verb right here. Okay. A man came having been sent from God. Well, how do we recognize this as a perfect participle? This one may not jump out at you. Mm, I see some clues here. Do you see the reduplication? It's a little hidden there, isn't it? Because remember, compound verbs, that is verbs that start with a preposition, will augment between the preposition and the, and the verbal. And the way they do it is often by just changing the letter. So, apa, now this is from apostello, with an omicron, becomes op e, op estal menos. Okay, so we have our reduplication. It's sort of hidden there, okay? But also notice here that there is no connecting vowel. We would expect op estal ominos if it were present, uh, but it's not. We just have uh, the men is tacked right on with no connecting vowel. So that's another clue that we're looking at a perfect in this case, passive. Notice that the man is not doing the sending, but the man is sent, having been sent. And again, we're using like having, trying to capture the idea of the perfect, that something happened in the past and that it, the effect of this continues on. So a man came, having been sent from God. Notice that the case number and gender, nice, easy two one two pattern. That's our nominative singular masculine it matches the man to which it's connected there. Okay, the man sent, the man came having been sent from God. There we go. As promised, here it is in verse six, agenata anthropos apestalmenos para theu. Anama auto Ioannis. Name to him, John. Here we go again in verse 24, same verb from apostello. But instead of apestal menos, we have apestal men oi. So what's the difference? Nominative plural subject here, right? So we're talking about some of the Pharisees were sent out, were literally being sent out. Uh, now, asan, here is the main word, they were being sent. Now, um, this combination, when you have a to be verb like this and a participle, it's called a periphrastic construction. It's something that we'll look at more in the second semester, but it emphasizes the ongoing nature. And in this case, this combination winds up being something called a pluperfect. Don't you just love all these new words? <laughs> but more about that to come. Uh, those are more fine, uh, fine nuances to the Greek. But just notice here that this is an adverbial participle. There's no article. And actually, it's being used with this to be verb. They were being sent out of the Pharisees. The last perfect participle in John 1 is in the last verse of John 1, John 151 here. And here it is, on e ogata. <laughs> what, a, what a mouthful there. And it, as a matter of fact, this is kind of a tricky one. So sorry about that. What was John thinking using that? But there he goes. Okay, let's read this together. Kai lege auto. So he says to him, Amen, amen, lego humin. Truly, truly, I say to you, Opsestha, you will see. Now, Opsestha, what's the lexical form of Opsestha? Horao. You remember that odd one? 
And let me just show you how I uh, how I cheat when <laughs> when I get stuck. I have Lagos, and so I just click on the words, and I see that this is from Horao, and that the future tense is Opsamai. So this is one of those with multiple roots. Look at your principal parts chart, and you'll see that word there. Okay, so you shall see the heaven, Tan Uranon, Anaogata. Let me say that right. Anaogata. There we go. Standing open. Okay. Well, okay. Well, it's helpful because I've given you the clue here that it's a participle. But wow, this one honestly might be hard to re uh, recognize because n just about nothing that we've studied would help us here. It's actually a perfect active participle. Normally, it would be caught, right, to be an active participle. But this one has dropped the kappa. It's a second perfect. Remember, all that means in, in, the, uh, in the perfect tense, but also in the er, uh, aorist passive tense, the seconds just mean that sometimes we drop, drop a letter. So here we drop the kappa. Instead of caught, we just have ought. Okay, well, how in the world would we know that, especially since we don't know this word? Well, once again, here's how you know. <laughs> you wouldn't know. You have to look that up. And there is so much good software out there. I mean, there's, there's no, uh, no reason to struggle. So what we do is we look this word up on a, on a ogata from on oigo. Okay, interesting. So this kind of looked like a preposition to me. And sure enough, it looks like, once again, we, our reduplication has happened between the preposition and the verbal part right here. And if we scroll on down, I think we find that this actually is a, yep, second perfect. See that? Anaoga. So uh, it gives us some clues. The other thing that's nice about this is that um, when, you, when you check this word out, I mean, it will just tell you here <laughs> that this is a uh, verb, perfect, um, active, participle, singular, si singular, accusative, masculine. So, I mean, all kinds of tools to cheat if you get stuck. But, okay, this one would be hard. I, I mean, and sometimes you just have to look them up. Um, so uh, you might be able to, you know, probably after third or fourth semester, you might recognize that one. But that's not easy. I, I just, I admit it. Okay. <laughs> you will see the heaven standing open. Kaitus angelus tutha'u. And the angels of God. Anabinantas kai katabinantas. Ascending and descending. From anabino and katabino, so these are just present active participles, right? So the angels we will be ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Well, what kind of a participle is this? There is no article, so we're tempted to think it must be adverbial. But in this case, it doesn't make sense. You shall see standing open. Are, what does it mean that you are standing open? That Obviously, this doesn't go with this verb. You will see heaven standing open. So this is a case where we have an adjectival participle that doesn't have the article. Standing open modifies heaven. You will see heaven standing open. Now, it's interesting that it's a perfect participle here that John chooses. Uh, so he doesn't just say it will happen. He says, you know, something happened and it will remain, okay? So that's a, that's a strong way that Jesus is uh, saying you will see heaven standing open there. Now just to look at a couple more, just to show you how rich these are. Uh, and when we start reading Greek texts, uh, you'll learn to love this perfect participle because it's often so rich with meaning. Well, let's just look at this one phrase in John 14, 9, where Jesus says, Ha heorakos eme heoraken tan patera. The one who has seen me has seen the Father. Okay? Now, okay, let's, uh, let's look at this participle for starters. How would we know that's a participle? Well, it's that awful word horao with the multiple roots again, <laughs> okay? And in the perfect, it is heoraka, okay? So here we have heorakos. There are two things that would make that jump out as a participle to me. The first one is the article. When you have an article and a verbal that you kind of looks weird to you, it's almost always a, a participle. Uh, so the article is a big clue. 
The other thing is this ending kos. It's the nominative singular masculine ending for the perfect participle, present perfect participle, and it's very common. So get used to those nominative singular masculine endings. So those things would have helped me recognize that. But this is a perfect active participle, nominative singular masculine. It means the one who has come to see me, and notice this is the emphatic form of me. That when you have that epsilon on the front, the one who has come to see me, and here we have just a plain old perfect indicative, has come to see the father, tan patera. Um, so th this is quite a, quite a strong statement. It's not, you can see what the translations have done. Whoever have seen, has seen me, or anyone who has seen me in the King, uh, NIV here, the New Living, anyone who has seen me. So you can see that it's really hard to get the, the strength of this. The one who has, has seen and continues to see me <laughs> has seen and continues to see the Father. But that would not be a, a very readable translation, would it? But the Greek has so much more richness than just, you know, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen my dad. I mean, it's so much more than that. Um, so it's, it's stressing the, the fact that you've seen him and, and continue to see. Here's one a lot of you will know, Ephesians 2, 8. Okay, let's just read a little together. Te, gar, charati, este, sesosmenoi, dia, pistaos. All right, well, dia pistaos means through faith. Hopefully you recognize that tricky genitive form there. That's that third declension pistis again. Okay, through faith. And, and at the beginning here, it is for, gar, remember, is post-positive, meaning that it comes after the first word. In English, we always put our conjunctions first, but in Greek, often they put them after the first word here. So for charati, okay, this is from charis. And do you re recognize that iota ending? And this is that uh, dative singular ending. So we'll use our keyword by. So for by grace, you are, that's esta, it's from a me. It's one of the forms of to be, which is also very important to learn to recognize. So it means you are, okay, here's our participle, sesos menoi. Now, how would you know that's a participle? Well, hopefully you see the men there and you think, okay, middle passive, participle. And you see this ending, oi, which is nominative plural masculine. And what kind of participle? You see the reduplication on the front. But what is the verb? Well, sometimes you just have to look them up. This is from sozo, and the perfect form of sozo has a sigma. It drops the, the zeta. So sesosmenoi, uh, you'll notice here too that there's no connecting vowel. Not sesosamenoi, but sesosmenoi. They just tack it right on there. Uh, all these are clues that we're looking at a perfect passive participle, nominative plural masculine. All right. Well, this combination, remember when you have a to be verb with a participle is called periphrastic. It means you are having been saved. It's a, it's a long way around to say something, but it means a lot here too. It places emphasis on the, the process that's taking place, but also the fact that it's, you know, it's done. So there was this process that began and it's ongoing. You are having been saved, <laughs> something like that. Really hard to translate. And you can see that most English translations just say you have been saved. You have been saved, NIV, or God saved you, Ephesians uh, 2.8 here in the New Living. Uh, notice they add God. God is not in this verse up here, but it's implied. That's called a divine passive. This is a passive voice, and the implied actor in this uh, action is God. So you were saved by God, right? So by grace, you are saved. You have been and are being saved by grace, dia pistaos, through faith.
excuse me, can you tell me where I am? I'm lost. You know I'm lost? I've lost all perspective. I'm so zoomed in. I'm so uh, like mired in the trees. I can, I've lost all perspective of the forest, right? So I need to back out. And in fact, when I back out, I realize oh, I'm in San Francisco. And I'm not only in San Francisco, I'm in California. And not only am I in California, I'm in the United States. And if I keep zooming out, I realize I'm on planet Earth. See? So I just needed a little perspective. Now I'm not lost anymore. I know exactly where I am in the universe. Well, <laughs> participles are sort of like that. You get zoomed in, you start looking at all these details, and you forget that all we're trying to do, remember, all we're trying to do is find the tense and voice, case number and gender, and the clues that we've learned continue to apply to the participles. Now we had to learn those morphemes and a few little things like that, but really there's not very much new with the participles. It's a matter of bringing all together. And that's what makes it hard, is we have these two universes colliding, right? We had our substantives with the case endings, and then we have our tense and voice with the verbals, and we bring it all together in this super fabulous explosion of Greek, um, what do you want to call this, Greek um, verbiage or Greek substantives. It's, it's hard to even identify exactly what a participle is, but they are spicy, man. They are the jalapeno pepper of Greek. So I hope you're learning to love them. You know, aren't they awesome? They can act like adjectives. They can act like adverbs. They are very flexible. They're really quite amazing. And they give us this great opportunity to review our substantives and our verbals and bring them together and show that it's all coming together for us. <laughs>